In this edition of Nebraska Stories, the wildly wonderful world of animals. Coming up, these hot dogs race for the finish line. Coffee, cats, and adoption. The return of the Sandhill Trumpeter Swans. And celebrating Groundhog Day in Unadilla. For 30 years, on a Saturday in July, the little town of Syracuse celebrates its German heritage. They'd hold their annual day-long festivities in October, but it's hard to compete with Husker football. even when your event includes a ceremonial keg tapping. Wow, there we go. There we go. I pose it, I pose it. Other activities include folk dancing, hammer schlagen, and a town parade. But among all the various things you can do at German Fest, it may be that the most popular event involves man's best friend. We say wiener dogs, but the German pronunciation would be wiener. So it first started off with the wiener dog races. And it's always been known as wiener dogs. People come from all over. They bring their dogs and race them. It's the cutest thing. Loves to sit on her pillow in front of the fireplace. He jumps and rolls for treats. Marvin will kiss you to death. Boys love to see me cool. <laughs> People come from Iowa, Kansas, Missouri. I mean, right in the southeast Nebraska corner, come all over from these four states. The community for dachshunds in general is such a strong, close-knit community. I mean, they are like hardcore dachshund owners that are so involved. And they come today, and they are just pumped to be here. Many love smelly rubs and pretty goats who love green, squeaky toys. We have five lanes. We have a person that will hold the dog, and then when the announcer says go, the dog is supposed to run to the welcomer at the other end. And the first dog to cross the finish line wins that heat, and they'll run a couple, three heats, and then we'll have the finals and grand champion. On your mark. have the senior long dogs, so the older dogs that want to race. And then we have the brats that are the middle-aged dogs. And then we have the little smoky, so the young pups. Those are our three categories. I think everyone is the fears of because even when I was calling back past contestants to see if they would come back this year, right away on the phone they said, well, Hank has won the past two years. I tried. The German Fest Wiener Dog races are a near perfect mix of fun and heart. 
The money collected from the small entry fee is donated to local animal shelters. And as it turns out, all that worry about reigning Wiener Dog Champ Hank dominating this year's race was unnecessary. This year's top dog was Cooper. He's 11 years old, and he was number 11 in the race, and this is the 11th year for this Dachshund races. So it was kind of a, really a kind of an omen at the beginning that he had a real chance at something special, so. last night. Come on, guys. It's time for breakfast. Come on. Yay. Look at all of you guys. Come on. Your tummy looks like you already had five breakfasts. Jessica Hoyne might just have the best job ever. You're so sweet. Are you ready for a busy day? Get it, girl. Good job, girlfriend. She's the cafe manager and unofficial cat wrangler at Philia's Cat Cafe. You are so sweet. It's an inventive nonprofit located on the western edge of Omaha's downtown, serving up equal parts coffee and cuddles. Philia's is the first and only cat cafe in our state, and that we have celebrated our one year anniversary with over 100 cats adopted within that first year is pretty amazing. I feel like that's an amazing thing for a first year nonprofit. But before the cafe opens for business, Hoyne spends some quality time with the cats. Every day starts attending to the crazy kittens in this room. They need food, they need water, they need their litter pans cleaned, keeping this room tip-top, sanitized, and clean is so essential. It's essential to their health, their happiness, of course, our health and happiness. I try to get everything done to spend enough time with them before we open for the day. It helps me grow connected, have a little connection with the kitties and with the cats, get to know their personalities. I almost feel a little bit like a human and cat matchmaker. I know which cats could go well with which personalities. They're all completely different. Some of them come in here really shy and timid. Some come in just ready to party 24 seven. And you just get to know their sweet, different personalities. The concept of cat cafes first became popular in Japan. But the trend has taken root in the U.S. in recent years. The goal is to revolutionize the cat adoption experience and educate the community through interaction. Hi. You have pretty eyes. With a full-service coffee bar, patrons can sip on a latte in the cafe and watch the cats through a large window. Or for a few dollars, they can take their coffee inside the playroom and score some snuggle time. It's being able to be around cats and seeing them in their natural environment, how they are in a room, how they would be at your home, letting them choose you, letting them come up to you. We want you to be able to see the personality of the cat without making them come to you. This is their house until they go to their forever home. But Philius is about more than stray cat rescues and adoptions. Some people aren't ready to adopt. Some people have cats of their own, but they like to support our mission, which I love. I love that. And I have my regulars who come in just to have a little bit of kitten therapy every week. I love that too. It's not all about coming here and taking a cat. It's also about 
having a space that feels safe, having a space that feels really happy, really comfortable, really almost, you know, calming. With an estimated 60,000 feral cats living on the streets of Omaha, Phileas also hopes to educate the community on the importance of caring for these cats with their Trap, Neuter, and Return program, or TNR. We really want to help community cats. That's why we started our TNR program. That's really important. So many people don't understand how easy TNR can be when you have so many feral cats that keep producing cycle after cycle after cycle of kittens. Like 80% of kittens born every year are born on the streets and they don't make it. Either they're too sick or shelters are completely overrun. So yeah, setting a humane trap is really pretty simple and it helps these cats to not have to fight to mate and fight for their food anymore. Poor mama cats won't have to have litter after litter of babies. Um, it's really the most humane thing to do for them. We have a pretty interested population of people you know, who love cats and would support a nonprofit like this where they can come and have a good cup of coffee, but also have a really great experience hanging out with cats and kittens, getting to know them. All right, hon, this is the adoption contract. Still, there's nothing better than when a feline finds his favorite human and his forever home. Are you ready to get your little guy? Yeah. My friend actually saw their page on Instagram, and we, like, in other states, we knew that they had cat cafes, but in Omaha, when they opened this one, we knew we had to come. <laughs> <laughs> so cute, those little paws. So when they were kitties here, I came, and I played with all three of them, and I liked him the most because he was the most energetic, and he was kind of, like, attracted to me as much as I was to him, so I picked him. <laughs> I think we got a good one. Here he is, at least you can see his tiny little face. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. The trumpeter swan is a really neat success story. They went extinct in the sand hills. Trumpeter swans are really good indicator species of the habitat quality. They're a big, beautiful white bird that is an icon of the Nebraska sand hills. The sand hills is still one of the last remaining intact grasslands left in the world. This is probably one of the few places where private industry, private ranchers have improved the land. I hope that I always get to make my life here in the Sand Hills. They're huge and they're heavenly white. A trumpeter swan actually is the largest waterfowl species in the world and they're beautiful. They're birds that are indicators of good water quality. They need big, open grasslands and wetlands and open bodies of water in order to thrive. We really don't know a lot about them, about their behavior. It's really fun to learn about them. <laughs> My name is Heather Johnson and I'm uh, researching trumpeter swans in the Nebraska Sand Hills at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. I'm also a wildlife biologist with Nebraska Game and Parks studying waterfowl. So historically, trumpeter swans breeding range range all the way up in Alaska and the boreal forest, and then the Sand Hills was the very south tip of that breeding range. And populations were upwards probably about half a million to a million. The fur trade industry played a large role in the depletion of the population of trumpeter swans. Their down feathers on their belly was very desired for women's powder puffs. The feathers were desired for clothing and hats and quill pens. In fact, Audubon himself preferred a quill pen for his drawings. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act is what saved these birds in 1918.
had that treaty been not put into place, we would not have trumpeter swans today. Nebraska Sandhills was a, was a core of their range, and they were wiped out of the sand hills wiped out in Nebraska, and then through conservation laws and a lot of conservation efforts over the last 100 years, trumpeter swans have started to come back. Make that look easy. <laughs> I didn't know he had one. Oh, yeah. We take an airboat out. We run up next to these birds and gently scoop them up with a big old scoop net. And then we bring them back. And then collect what we call body condition data. And that's how you can determine how healthy a bird is. And over the last three years, we've been putting on GPS satellite collars. So we've been tracking these swans. We're looking where they're going in the winter. Um, let's take her back down there. We're trying to get a handle on the population numbers, and not necessarily just the numbers, but the trends, if they're going up and going down. And what we have been seeing actually over the years is we've seen an increasing population. So the overall number of swans has increased, but the proportion of juveniles is kind of slightly decreasing. There's a lot of opportunity for predators to get a hold of these birds. Some predators would include northern pike, snapping turtles, birds of prey. Those are kind of their main predators. And then there's also, you know, weather, many other factors that can affect survival. Well, one of the things that we're anticipating or could anticipate, um, you know, wind energies and one of those things that may be cropping up in the sand hills and it has in, in one or two spots. And with that, you have a lot of transmission lines and so forth. And some of those things may be cutting across some of the wintering areas that these birds use. And so what would that do for those swans? Uh, where you put those transmission lines are really important because if you put them next to a key wintering ground, you know, these birds didn't evolve with big, long, thick wires spanning across the sky, you know, so um, that can be a, a death trap. First time I saw a trumpeter swan was probably in the late 60s at La Creek up there north of Merriman. My name's A.B. Cox, and I live on Calf Creek Ranch. This is Calf Creek, uh, north of Mullen, Nebraska, in southern Cherry County. I'm Shelley Kelly. I grew up uh, by Brewster, Nebraska, on a ranch, family operation, and uh, just always loved the sand hills. The trumpeter swan is kind of a iconic species because it sticks out so much. People pay attention to the swans, and even ranchers that have lived here their whole lives, uh, like myself, when we see a trumpeter swan, it's really exciting. What we do know is if we have a healthy landscape, we know that it's better for the swans. It's not a competing interest. You know, wildlife and, and ranching, they're not on different hands. They share the same goals. 
And those ranchers have been real good stewards of this landscape because they need good grass too. You know, in a way, they're grass farmers. We just see it as we are trying to be good stewards and leave it as best we can. I care about these birds because they're remarkable. I think about what would the world look like if they weren't in it. You know, to me it'd be a um, pretty boring place. It's a real conservation success story. That's because of an awful lot of people that are dedicated their lives and their efforts to help bring these birds back. So it's a pretty cool deal, but there's no finish line in conservation. And um, so we have to keep, keep thinking about these birds and what they represent and, and um, really celebrate them so we can have them around for a long time. Unadella Bell is uh, a groundhog that was eating cabbage in my garden. I saw my cabbage was eaten and I looked over there and there he was laying there. And so I picked him up and I took him to the taxidermist. He uh, stuffed him for $14. He's gonna determine whether he sees his shadow or not. And of course, if he sees his shadow, it's six more weeks of winter. If he doesn't see his shadow, then spring's right around the corner. That's what we're hoping for. But the facts are the facts, you know that. Seven thirty-two. I don't see a shadow. Do you, Brody? No, I don't. Bill's requested that I make a short statement. Hear ye, hear ye. I am Unadella Bell. I'm in my thirtieth year. No shadow I see, and predict spring is near. Yay. Early spring. <laughs> Who wrote that for you, Bob? <laughs> Thanks, nice, Brody. Thanks for the help. <laughs> so was you, was you kind of fudging on it? Uh-oh. <laughs> Don't record that. <laughs> Is it better than Christmas? Probably. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty good day then, isn't it? The best part is uh, the parade, probably. A great time for kids, a great time for people to come back to Unadilla that naturally with a town of 311, a lot of people that live here have moved away. It's a good reason to get out, see people you haven't seen in a few years, few months, few days, catch up. People you graduated with from high school, or even grew up with, when you were this tall and they'll come back, enjoy the day. For the Syracuse German Fest flow, and uh, I've got the wiener dog hat on today because of the wiener dog races that are always at the he German likes Fest. Wiener dogs! <laughs> <laughs> it's very quirky. Everybody's here to have a good time. It's about community, it's about tradition, it's about having fun. Something to do to break the monotony through the season, actually. And it's it's fun and we had brought pair of mules here to one to ride to represent a saddle mule and the other one as a driving animal is what we've done. Well you know you guys got a huge competitive advantage by having a parade on a day when nobody else has it. <laughs> now therefore I P Ricketts, governor of the state of Nebraska, do hereby proclaim the community of Unadilla, Nebraska as the groundhog capital of Nebraska. One of the special things about parades in small towns is that the community really comes out and supports it. It really gives it a, a special flavor. Hey, 
Bob Brain asked us to dress up as Groundhog today to uh, just help celebrate Groundhog's Day and the parade we have at Unadilla. It's masked identity. No one knows who you are. You can just hug people and give my fives and dance. We just work for him in the summer and stuff. Just do whatever he tells us. We have an official car at Groundhog's Day, the Ford Falcon, which was introduced on Groundhog's Day back in the late 50s. Well, we were just told that the groundhog was killed about 20 years ago. <laughs> and, and they just drive him around and he's stuffed. You know, until a bill is dead. <laughs> well, if you're not here, you should be here. Yeah, you're Because out. you're missing out. This, this, this is huge. The whole town's here. Half of Lincoln's here, part of Omaha. We're all having fun. What made it successful was all the kids just being happy. That's that's all that counts. Anything that's successful is whatever they have a smile on their face, you know it's successful. I put smiles on kids' faces. And that's what I'm happy about. Watch more Nebraska Stories on our website, Facebook, and YouTube. Nebraska Stories is funded in part by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation.